Okay, good afternoon, colleagues and friends. It's a pleasure to have you here for this seminar, and it's a pleasure to introduce Paul Bossart, who will speak today in our AOWAC seminar. But before we go to that, I would like to do some housekeeping. Uh, I'm a very untrained person with computers, so therefore we will not have a chat kind of exchange this afternoon. However, for all the questions we leave place at the end of the talk. So we have 15 minutes for discussion and I would actually invite everybody if there are questions to post them directly after the seminar of Paul. About the Thursday beer, if you want to discuss further about the seminar, everybody is welcome to have come for the Thursday beer, which starts today 15 minutes later than normal. So at 5.15, because I'm of course also engaged there. Now, having said that, it's a real pleasure to have Paul Bossart with us. Well, some people believe uh, I was always at AIRWAG. This is not true. I used to have a life before my time at AIRWAG. And during my uh, time at ETH, I actually was in first contact with Paul Bossart. At that time, he did his PhD for Strukturgeologie, for Structural Geology at ETH. And Paul, it was amazing you put even some interest in earth science in my brain, which I'm still very, very like about that. So since then, I was actually interested in the thing between earth sciences and physics. Paul started, uh, uh, did his PhD at ETH on structural geology, and he worked in the Himalaya, and uh, where he analyzed the structure and folding of this mountain belt. Later in his career, he was actually working as a researcher in several subground and rock laboratories around the world. He worked in Sweden, he worked in Japan, and he worked on the rock laboratory in Grimsel, where he was also first in contact with geotechnical aspects on uh, rock laboratories and, of course, with nuclear waste disposal. So, from this experience, Paul was actually asked to take in 1995 uh, to take over the project at Monterey, which is the Swiss laboratory, rock laboratory that is operating in Opolinus clay. And some of you may know Opolinus clay is supposed to be the host rock for the Swiss nuclear waste disposal. Rock, uh, Paul was engaged in many projects in Monterey, and in 2005, he became the director of Monterey, where he still is working, and he's guiding this rock laboratory until now. In 2018, also on the initiative of Paul, a consortium of ETH, PSI, and AIRWAC joined the rock laboratory at Monterey as partner, which allows us in the consortium to be engaged actively in all the experiments at Monterey and to suggest new experiments in the context of nuclear waste disposal and CO2 sequestration, the subject that Paul is talking about in a few minutes. And, and last but not least, Paul, you are close to be free again. I learned that you will leave the Rock Laboratory next year. So this is quasi your goodbye kind of tour around the world. I'm very happy to have you with us and I look forward for your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolf Kipfer, for this nice introduction. Uh, yes, I try to give you an overview of, of the research. I will not go too much into detail, but really to get uh, you an overview. I would also like to mention my uh, co-authors uh, or my team. This is David Jecki, Christoph Nussbaum and Senezio Schäfer. Uh, all of them working in my team in the Monterey Rock Laboratory at St. Sun. And I will tell you something about the research in the field of the radioactive waste, but also about the disposal of CO2. Now, uh, this is the content. So first is a, is a short introduction and organization of the rock laboratory, also a little bit geology. Then 
the main topic is experiments in the field of radioactive waste disposal and experiments in the field of geological carbon storage. And then at the end, some conclusions. Now, what is a rock laboratory? First of all, it's a research facility for technology and to develop different type of methods. And experiments and tests are possible in a larger scale, in the meter to several decameter scales. Because when you are normally in a lab, you have small rock samples, perhaps in the centimeter or millimeter space. Here we can really work in the decameter space. Demonstration experiments for deep geological disposal. Yes, we have to uh, demonstrate the feasibility. This is true for radioactive waste and or also for CO2. The second objective is to acquire knowledge for the long-term performance of a repository system. And you know, these type of projects, they, are, they are go on for several decades, for, for several generations. And we have to acquire this knowledge to keep the knowledge and also to give the knowledge to the next generations. This is an important aim. And finally, we have to obtain robust data for the development and testing of safety assessment models. So here the modeling comes, uh, becomes very important because the time spans, they are quite large. And we have to understand the processes and also to simulate them and to validate the models. Worldwide, there are generic and site-specific rock laboratories. Here you see a map. And altogether, there are about 30 rock laboratories. Most of them are either in granite, in salt, or in clay stones. Now we can distinguish between generic rock laboratories here in green and in blue, and site-specific rock laboratories. Generic rock laboratories are sites where there will be never a disposal site. These aim only for the research. And we can distinguish in between the, the, uh, the, the green ones, which are built on pre-existing tunnels. You see most of them are on pre-existing tunnels. And there are also uh, generic laboratories which are built on purpose. So uh, a new tunnel for a generic rock laboratory. And then a few of them are site-specific rock laboratories. There are about four today. And these are really laboratories where just the disposal, for example, of radioactive waste is just in it or in the neighborhood. Switzerland has three generic rock laboratories, and this is very unique in worldwide. We are the only country who has so much rock laboratories. We have the Monterrey, I will tell you today, but then we have also the Grinsel test site, and then we have also Petretto, which is a new one, which is also a rock laboratory by ETH, where uh, research on the geothermal energy is carried out. Now let's go to the Monterrey rock laboratory. First of all, who is participating? There are 22 partners from nine countries. Uh, there are mainly implementers and safety organizations, implementers like NAGRA from Switzerland, safety organizations like ENSI from Switzerland. There are also oil and gas companies, like for example, Chevron and uh, Total from France. And in total, there are more than 1,000 scientists, engineers, and technicians who have mandates and who are carrying out the research. And as Rolf Kiepfer already mentioned, since 2018, uh, ETH is partner. It's the EAVAC, uh, the PSI, the HOT Laboratory, the Engineering Geology, and the Swiss Seismological Survey. How does it look like in a rock laboratory? I would like to give you some impressions. First of all, we have tunnels about five meter high. You see here two persons. Uh, this is just a, a front of an excavated section. And here you can really see the rock. However, this rock is not very stable. It's a weak rock. And in order to work, you have to place shotcrete to the tunnel 
uh, in order that you don't have a collapse and that uh, you can safely work. Here, for example, this is a drilling team. You see, we can make boreholes and so on and installations. Basically, we are measuring. A lot of experiments are measuring different type of, of measurements, different type of parameters. Here, for example, this is a geotechnical measurement. Here we have a tunnel with steel arcs. And here we are measuring just the deformation of the steel arcs and also the rock. But normally the experiments are carried out in boreholes. So you do not see the experiment. The experiment is just in boreholes. And here you have a perspective view of a part of the rock laboratory. In total, we have about 1,300 boreholes and total length is about 20 kilometers. And most of the experiments are occurring in boreholes. Uh, this is just an example of a microbial experiment. So here you see the surface equipment. Uh, here just the scientists are preparing, but the experiment is then downhole. There are several lines which are going downhole and here is, are the control panels and also the, the containers for the, for the samples. Now let's do a little bit uh, of the geology. First of all, here on the left hand side, you see the rock laboratory. It's just in the canton of Jura in northwestern Switzerland in a tunnel, in the Monterey Tunnel. This uh, is just the highway connecting Switzerland with France. And here you see the main tunnel with the cars, besides is a, is a security gallery, and all the rest is the rock laboratory. And there were different excavation phases. And I can say every time when we need space, for new experiments, we will do an excavation. This here on the right hand side is just a geological framework. We are here in the active Rheingraben or in the extension. So these are the Jura Mountains, this is Rheingraben, Basel is about here, Zurich is about here. And I have to say one never will construct a repository in an active Graben, in a tectonically active Graben. This Graben is still going down yeah, and we have earthquakes. So Monterey is not suitable for high level or low level radioactive waste. The sites which have been proposed by Nagra, they are not here, but they are in the north of Zurich and also in the canton of Argovy, which has a certain distance to this active graben. And what is common to Monterey and the future sites is the rock, the host rock, and this is the opalinus clay. And it is confirmed in Switzerland for the disposal of radioactive waste. And here now in the bottom, you see a geological profile. So a profile going from south east to northwest. Uh, here you see different hills in the Jura Mountains. The Monterey Rock Laboratory is here, and it's just in this tunnel. This is the Monterey uh, Tunnel. And here you see also why we have constructed the rock laboratory, because the opalinus clay, which is here, this blue layer, this has been uh, buckled, it has been folded due to a trust where the whole layer cake has been trusted over the tabula jura. And if you have a tunnel here, the access is for no costs. You see also the activity, the seismic activity, all the points here, the colored points, these are focal mechanisms of earthquakes. And basically we have strike slip faulting, but we have also overtrust faulting. And these are quite shallow earthquakes. So they are in the layer cake of the sediments and they are not necessarily in the basement. What is also unique at Monterey, because the strata are deformed, are fault planes. Fault planes are just planes where different uh, rocks have been sheared uh, against other rocks. And uh, this is a, a fault plane. So the upper part has been trusted from left towards the right. And in the geology, we are calling this slick and slide. So we can just say the shear sense, but also the shear direction. And one would not go in a, uh, for a repository site where I have a lot of fault planes. So we can say finally, if it works here at Monterey, it works also on much better sites like in uh, the sites where, which has been proposed by Nagra. 
what is also interesting, we can make here when we make a, 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 a cross cut. And if you go through the electron microscope, then we see just on the surface newly formed elite. And we can date this elite. So we can say the age of these truss planes. For example, it was the question, is this just a very recent truss plane or is it an old one? I can tell you we have ages between 10 and 5 million years, which is connected to the folding of the whole Jura chain. Now let's go a little bit more into detail. Uh, this is just a map of the Monterey Rock Laboratory. So the strata are dipping with 45 degrees uh, towards the southeast. And here you see we have different colors. On the base of the Opalinus clay, we have this yellow color, which is a so-called shaley type or the shaley phases. Then in the middle, we have a, a carbonate rich phases, uh, much just more a limey a type. And here in the upper part in orange, we have the shaley type or the shaley phases. And as I've shown you on the previous slide, there are a lot of these fault planes. Uh, which uh, we have just here. And one, just one, one major fault, which you are calling the main fault, is just a trust zone just crossing here, the rock laboratory. Uh, why is the clay called Opalinus clay? There is an ammonite we have found. This is uh, from Monterey, very nice uh, uh, ammonite. Uh, and we can determine its age. It has an age of 174 million years. The mineralogy and the key parameters of the Opalinus clay. I do not go into detail, but here you see the three phases types and what is common, the shaley phases and the sandy phases, they have an average of about 10% of elite smexedite mixed layers. And these are just the minerals which are capable to swell. And this is a, a big advantage because when you have an earthquake forming cracks, these cracks will just be sealed by these swelling minerals. Then we have quartz, carbonates, feldspars, pyrite, and so on. And you see in the sandy phases, uh, we have just a little bit more quartz. This is also the reason why it is sandy. And we have a little bit less clay minerals. And in the shaley phases, we have more clay minerals, but less uh, quartz. And here on the right hand side, we have the key parameters. I have just selected four of them. First of all, the water loss porosity. Uh, it's 16 volume percent at uh, 105 degrees Celsius. This means that in one cubic meter, we have about 160 liters of pore water inside, which is a lot. But due to the very, very small hydraulic conductivity in the order of two times 10 to the minus 13 meters per second, this water is not able to flow. Then thermal conductivity is about 1.7 Watt per meter per Kelvin, which is quite small. And this is uh, really a disadvantage uh, because when you are placing radioactive waste producing heat, uh, this heat is not going away and you, will, you have the risk of overheating the rock and changing the mineralogy. And finally, a mechanical parameter, universal compressive strength, which is about 11 megapascal. It's quite a weak rock and you have to make a support, otherwise tunnels will collapse. Okay, I come to the second point and these are experiments in the field of radioactive waste disposal. Now here you see a diagram. First of all, the Swiss concept, which is developed by NAGRA, foresees to put the waste in the Opalinus clay here at the depths of about 400, between 400 and 900 meters. And the detail is you have three barriers. You have a steel container containing the high level waste. Uh, the second barrier is a bentonite buffer which fills the space between the steel container and the rock. And then the third barrier is 50 meters above and 50 meters below of Opalinus clay. And here you see these emplacement galleries. So this diagram shows you, uh, first of all, the human activities in a time scale of about 1 million years. First of all, there's construction, then emplacement of the, of the waste, the backfill, a lot uh, of monitoring period, 
and finally the ceiling of the ramps and the shafts. And in yellow, you have the processes. First of all, we have oxidizing conditions. Then we have elevated temperatures once we are placing the, the waste. And the canisters, they are getting up to 150 degrees Celsius hot. And then what is also important is this EDZ. EDZ stands for excavation damaged zone. I will show you later. And due to the fact that the humidity is then coming from the rock into this bentonite, this bentonite will be saturated, it swells. The humidity goes also to the steel container. And then you're starting a process of anaerobic canister corrosion. You start to form hydrogen. And what we have also found in the recent years, there's microbial degradation of this hydrogen. But after some time, let's say after a few thousand of years, also the stainless steel canister, they will fail, they are corroded and the radium cleats are released. So this is the basic, these are the basic processes. And we assume that in the first 10,000 years, we do not have equilibrium. And after 10,000 years, we have more or less again equilibrium as before the excavation. And now to the experiments, we can now translate the experiments in a more a scientific diagram. It's just the same like that one, but it's a more a scientific one. Here you see the abbreviations of the experiments. And we have about here, we have 43 experiments. And here you see the diagram. Here again, the time with the human activities. And here you see two curves. The red one is the heat. So when you place the high level waste, you will create a lot of heat. There's a peak but with time it's degradating. And uh, another percent, uh, process is the saturation of the bentonite here, just with the blue curve. So these two curves are competing. Heat becomes smaller, but saturation becomes uh, larger. And now we can distinguish between three types of experiments. First of all, we have uh, experiments dealing with initial conditions. Then we have experiments with early time perturbations here in green. And then we have experiments going from the transient state to the late time equilibrium. I do not want to show you all of the experiment, but I have selected some of them. So I have selected one experiment of the initial conditions and some experiments about early time perturbations and from the late time equilibrium. First of all, initial conditions. This is an experiment dealing with the initial pore water composition in the undeformed intact rock. And here you see a typical water sampling out of Monterey. There is a sodium chloride bromide water with total uh, dissolved solids of about 18 grams. Compared to modern seawater, we have about still half of it in the pore space. Here you see just a bromide chloride diagram where we have plotted all the water samples that the bromide versus the chlorides. And you see these points are just lying on the seawater line, which means that we have an indirect proof that at least partly of this uh, pore water is of marine origin. And by the way, this probe comes from here uh, just from, from, from this side. Now, when we plot, for example, the chloride uh, concentrations along the gallery, we see this pattern. So here on the left, this is uh, the aquifer. So this is Opolinus clay, this is aquifer again. So the Opolinus clay is sandwiched in between two aquifers. And here you see, for example, the, the green points. These are pore waters which has been squeezed out of the samples or pore waters from test intervals. We have many boreholes. And what you hear, what you need is time. For example, you're waiting several years until a few milliliters are just flowing into the borehole. You can collect this and then making just uh, the analysis. But you see here this pattern. We have higher concentrations in the middle and in the lower part and rather small concentrations in, in the drinking water quality aquifers. How can you interpret that? The best interpretation is by a diffusion model. And we have here a best fit. These curves in the middle means that diffusion has started 6.3 million years ago. So first of all, 
the, radio, uh, the chlorides have been diffusing out into the upper lying aquifer and also into the underlying aquifer. And here we think this is a natural analog for molecular diffusion, showing us that during the last six million years, diffusion was the governing transport process. Now, let's talk about early time perturbation. And this is the excavation damage zone. It's very important feature. First of all, when you construct a tunnel in this weak rock, and here you see the theory, you have a stress redistribution and the stresses here, they are higher than the uniaxial compressive strengths. And by a result, you will break down the rock. And this we can just see in the side wall of a tunnel. Here we have a lot of fractures which are just uh, diminishing and uh, the more you go into the rock. Another thing is when you are trading parallel to the bedding, to the bedding planes, then where the bedding is tangent to the borehole circumference, there you have buckling and you have breakouts. And this here is the second examples. This was a micro tunnel. And here at the 11 o'clock and at the five o'clock we have breakouts. So this features, this is an excavation damage zone. And here, this is just shortly what we have learned about. So we have many fractures in the first, let's say meters. We have up to 60 fractures per meter, which is a lot of in this fracture network. And when you look at the fracture surfaces, then normally you see gypsum spots. So that means oxygen has entered into the um, connected fracture network and pyrite uh, has been oxidized and uh, there was creation of gypsum. This is true, for example, in the first 70 centimeters. Then when you are going further in, the fractures are more isolated. But in these fractures, you have also quite high gas permeabilities, or you have a P and P wave and S wave velocities, which are smaller in the first two meters than in the intact rock. And here you have an example of a hydraulic mechanical uh, uh, effect. Here, for example, we have placed in the borehole four sensors and just me measuring the pore water pressure. And then there was a tunnel front approaching these sensors. And then when the tunnel front was quite near the sensors, pressures, they went up. And when the tunnel front has passed the sensors, pressures were going down. And why is that normally when you have such a thing, pressures are going down when you have a tunnel front. But here, first of all, they are going up. And the reason is a hydraulic mechanical effect. That means when the, the tunnel phase is approaching, then you have a compaction of the rock due to the stress redistribution. Uh, it's a compaction, the pore space is deformed, but the water cannot flow because hydraulic uh, uh, conductivity is too small. Therefore, pressure is first going up. And then with time, it is dissipating. For example, this sensor, it was just in the excavation damage zone in the first 70 centimeter. And suddenly, here you see uh, it was connected to the tunnel, uh, to the tunnel with atmospheric pressure. The same thing, uh, which is a little bit more complicated, uh, happens when you combine these uh, uh, HM effects with temperature. And we have several experiments at the Monterey where we have placed, for example, three canisters with a heating source. We are not allowed to take radioactive waste. And then we are heating the rock. And one effect when you are heating the rock, here you see heating curves, that's the temperature, you are also increasing the pore water pressure. And why is that? The effect is that, that the expansion, the thermal expansion coefficient of, a, of pore water is about five times higher than the expansion coefficient of the rock. And again here, hydraulic conductivity is small and water cannot flow. Uh, it's expanding, so the pressure is going up. And here, this is really a, a risk when you have high level waste, you can increase the pressure in such a way that you have thermal fracturing and uh, creating uh, new fractures. And this we want to avoid. We want also to avoid that, for example, the mineralogy is changed. 
Now, from transient to late time equilibrium, these are corrosion experiments. We know when moisture is going to the stainless steel, we have corrosion. And this is just an experiment dealing with this corrosion. So here we have a, a drill core, a big one, where we have placed several types of steel. Here is a circuit of warm water, a closed circuit, which is just simulating the heat. And in blue, we have a circuit of pour water in order to saturate it. And then by, uh, uh, by impedance measurements, by uh, chemical uh, thermal, by uh, hydraulic chemical impedance uh, measurements, uh, we can calculate the corrosion rates. And uh, first of all, we had a lot of problems uh, in order to make these measurements. There was a lot of electromagnetic noise, but then it worked. And then what we have found out with time, corrosion is going back. Here, just somebody opened the valve and the oxygen was going into the system and we had to start again. But we can say we have a corrosion rate about from 0 0.6 to 3 micrometers uh, in about 4.5 years. And the steel, what happens with the steel? We have oxidation of the steel, of the steel surfaces. And also another thing is, we know that when we have an anaerobic corrosion of steel, we are generating H2, but we never measured H2. And uh, that was a really, we were really astonished. And then we made an, another experiment. We told us if you don't measure hydrogen, we are directly, uh, injecting hydrogen into the rock. And this is with this array, a borehole. Here you have the inlet, and here you have just uh, the withdrawal, and here's the surface equipment. So here are the, just the container uh, with, with the hydrogen inside. We used also uh, neon and helium as other gases. And what we have measured, unexpected decrease of hydrogen concentrations. And here we have to make an up concentrations, again, loss of hydrogen. And here, these are several types where we have make up concentrations in order to keep the hydrogen concentrations. But the other cases as neon helium behave as expected. They are just here. And now we could confirm that we have a loss of hydrogen, but why? disappears hydrogen. And the answer again is microbial activity. And here this was a very interesting design of an experiment by the EPFL. Here's the surface equipment. This is the borehole. This is a closed cir uh, circuit under a, a argon uh, glove box. And first of all, this uh, PhD student, he made the circuit and he took, he took a lot of samples. He went to the laboratory, he looked for bacteria and he analyzed their DNA and he could say something about the species of, uh, of this uh, uh, bacteria. And then after 150 days, so you see here in the first 150 days, he could just measure the, the depletion of the oxygen, then iron two was oxidized to iron three. And here he placed the source of hydrogen. And then suddenly the sulfides, they increased like H2S. And here he could really demonstrate that the sulfide, that the sulfates uh, are becoming reduced and you're forming, forming sul sulfides. And he could also show the microbial community that these are dominated by sulfate reducing bacteria. So we can conclude hydrogen is consumed by microorganism. So we have solved the problem. We do not have very high gas pressures, but we have another problem. And this uh, is the H2S. Uh, this will accelerate, for example, the corrosion of the steel containers. And at the very end, we have when the radionuclides are coming out, we have diffusion experiments. And here we are not waiting until these are corroded, but we are making experiment here in a, in a borehole, uh, which are connected to two vessels. And for example, in one, we have sorbing tracers and in the other one, we have uh, less sorbing tracers and we are making a circuit. And after, let's say one to five years, we are overcoring the whole thing. And then we can look in the overcore how much these uh, tracers have been 
went into the rock. This is an example for the HTO, for the tritiated water. And here we have learned a lot. We have learned about anion exclusion processes. We have learned about the cation exchange and the sorption processes. Uh, just cation, it's, it's not very easy to, to make experiments because uh, normally they are not penetrate on a large distance in, into the rock. And we have also anisotropy effects. And what we will do now in the next time is to make experiments uh, where we have, where we simulate an early canister failure, where we still have heat. And therefore we are planning boreholes uh, which are not heated and just in the neighborhood, a borehole which is heated. And diffusion coefficients, for example, they are higher uh, when we have a heat source. And here you can see just the tracer cocktail. So we have the tritiated um, water, but we have also iodine 129 just when we receive the permission to do so, and here some uh, cations. Yeah, and now finally, let's say something about the experiments in the field of the geological carbon storage. And now I have a few slides left. Here you see the problem. In Switzerland, when we want to store uh, CO2, we need to have a reservoir. And opalinus clay has now a complete different function it is then a cap rock. However, this cap rock is not tight. And we have some problems. One of the problems is we have a lot of boreholes just crossing the Opalinus clay. We have about a little bit uh, in, in the order of thousand boreholes, which are not documented. And if a CO2 bloom is arriving in a borehole, uh, it can just migrate to the biosphere. Another threat is we have fault. We have false tectonic faults, and we do not know when CO2 is entering in such a fault, what happens? Do we create earthquakes? Okay, so this is the problem. And what these are the objectives? Uh, we want to improve the knowledge on the processes. Uh, what are really uh, the processes and the efficiency uh, and the integrity of CO2 storage sites? And we have also three issues which we are now looking at. One is well integrity, where we are looking at the flow passes and the ceiling. Another one is the fault integrity, where we are looking at CO2 entering into a fault. And then finally, we have also cap rock integrity. I do not show you all the three fields. I want to show you one, which is fault integrity. And fault, we have this very nice main fault in Monterey. So here you see intact rock. And here you see a, a fault zone, which can be several of meter thickness. Here the uh, top part of the fault is quite sharp. Here we have a fault gouge, scaly clay, so that, that the rock has really crushed. But then we have also quite discrete planes, um, like I've shown you with the slick and slidey planes, where we have uh, uh, really good defined planes where uh, CO2 can, can migrate. So we have really a good experimental site. Uh, the sites, they are about um, down to about between 35 meters and about uh, uh, 50 meters depths below surface. And this is just uh, an experimental layout uh, of such an experiment. We have a, a special niche. Uh, this is basically uh, um, uh, uh, governed by the ETH, so the principal investigator is, is by ETH. So here you see the experiment. You, you have a, a CO2 injection borehole, and here we have a CO2 withdrawal borehole. The distance is only about one meter. Uh, only the, these two boreholes are just crossing into the main fault. Then we have oblique boreholes where we have seismic, active seismic uh, devices, sensors inside. Uh, and then we have also here the vertical boreholes where we have mechanical instruments inside in order to see the displacement. And last not least, in order to uh, see the breaks of the CO2, um, we have the so-called mini ruidy mass spectrometer. And uh, thank you, Professor Rolf Kipfer and Matthias Brennwald for AirWark, who met us to, uh, who gave us this uh, equipment. And here we can very nicely also measure uh, all the gases. 
Yeah, here in the active seismic uh, monitoring, you see, we can just see very small differences in the CO2 migration. So here you see, for example, this is just before the injection and this is uh, during and after the injection more. And you see this, for example, the VP uh, changes, also the uh, velocity changes of the P waves is changing. I cannot show you the results because this is just a paper which will be issued soon. Uh, it's Sapone et al. Uh, and, uh, but I can show you a little bit the more uh, qualitatively the results. CO2 breakthrough was after four months and we have only uh, recovered uh, about t two to three uh, percent of the injected CO2 in the test interval. But what was very interesting was the hydraulic transmissivity of the fault, of this fault, so the, the transmissivity or the hydraulic conductivity first increased and then it decreased. And the migration of CO2 must be along very discrete fractures crossing the main fault. And here we can also say when we look at the, this picture here, that's the cross section here, the injection interval was Q4 here. And the, uh, the withdrawal interval was M1. So the CO2 has really crossed the main fault. And this was, we were really astonished because we were expecting CO2 is migrating parallel to the fault. The other, the last thing is that the risk of induced seismicity in the cap rock seems to be very low. And we have questions, for example, is this decline in transmissivity, is this a sealing or a healing of the fault? And if so, what are the mineral phases? And therefore, this experiment needs to be dismantled. And also, this HMCB processes, so hydraulic, mechanical, chemical, biological processes, this we have to understand. And I think the understanding is now in a quite preliminary stage. And the problem of this experiment is we are not super critical. Uh, and the question is, do we have to plan a new experiment in a larger scale? Yes, we have. So here is just a rock laboratory. And here you have these trusts. And we are planning to make an experiment in a deep borehole of about one kilometer, just in the reservoir of the Muschelkalk. So here we have the upper Muschelkalk. And the cap rock then here, the Opolinus clay. And here, when you have several, uh, for example, observation balls, we could very nicely uh, demonstrate the feasibility of such uh, CO2 disposal. By the way, this is an existing borehole, and we could prove that we are here still in the uh, uh, tabula jura. Okay, so I come to the conclusions. And uh, the Monterey project in its rock laboratory is a scientific and technological platform for the geological disposal in the Opolinus clay, host rock for radioactive waste and the cap rock for CO2 integrity experiments. Then the Monterey rock laboratory contributes considerably to the safety and technical feasibility of a future Swiss repository for high level waste in the Opolinus clay and the Clay stone, the Opolinus clay has been confirmed as the host rock for low level waste and high level waste in Switzerland. And the Monterey Rock Laboratory is also open to non nuclear research projects. CO2 cap rock integrity experiments have already been started, and experiments dealing with hydrothermal energy could also follow. There are still questions about deep geological disposal. Of particular importance are the hydraulic chemical processes, e.g. in the excavation damage zone. And the long-term goal is to understand the THMCB systems. And here, I think the EAVAG expertise could play a major role in answering these questions. Thank you for your attention. And thank you also to the organizers, uh, especially to Rolf uh, Kipfer. Thank you.